interests of time and everything, I'm going to march forward. Thank Call you. this meeting to order. And we'll start with standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. And since Mr. Jones isn't here, uh, Mr. Wupsko, if you'd give the invocation after the... I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we can gather together and do your work for the county's work. Guide us as we make decisions tonight. Guide us, guide those that are making their presentations, that they are clear and their messages are understood, that we can represent them. Lord, guide us through the evening to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, next we have a setting of the agenda. Is there any additions or uh, corrections or additions to the agenda? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make one suggestion, and that is no new business after 9 o'clock. Now, I can make that form of a motion or discussion. So are you, I, to clarify that, you're saying... We won't start any new business, but we'll continue to discuss? Exactly. All right. If that's a motion, I'll second it. Motion made. Motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor, saying aye. 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 Opposed, same. Motion is carried. The agenda has been altered to include that there will be no more formal presentations after 9 p.m. All right, at this time, the agenda says we're going into closed session. Do I hear a motion to go into se closed session? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Whereas the Board of Supervisors at Mack County desires to discuss and close meeting the following matters, discussion concerning prospective business or industry or expansion of an existing business or industry, where no previous announcement has been made of the business or industry's interest, in locating or expanding its facilities in the community. Discussion of the award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds, including interviews of bidders or officers and offerers and discussion of terms or scope of such contract. Whereas discussion is an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body concerning a radio system. Whereas pursuant to section 2.2-371, subsection A5, and 2.2-371, subsection A29 of the Code of Virginia, such discussion may occur in closed session. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Board of Supervisors at Mays County does hereby authorize discussion of the aforestated matters in closed meetings. All in favor, sign or, uh, signify saying aye. 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 Myself, I opposed. Hearing none, we will now move to closed session, and you guys can stay put. We're just going to go move into the small room and invite Mr. Bosslinger to come along with us. To the best of your knowledge, were the only matters discussed in the closed meeting public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements, and that only such public business matters as Yes. 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 All right. So I guess the first item is now to hear from Mr. Jonathan Garrett, Appomattox Volunteer Fire Department. We need to wait for Mr. Jones as he leaves Mr. Jones coming back? I don't know. No, no he has another okay. meeting. Um, Lucas is going to hand out a pr the presentation that I'm going to be referencing. I know you said that, but I thought uh, you skipped it. 
Thank you. Is it? I was just going to ask yeah. the same thing. Hey, how are you? Hey, missed you the other night. So in y'all's packet, you're going to have some updated information. When we uh, submitted our paperwork the other day, we didn't have everything back from our CPA, so now we've got um, everything back from them. So I provided you with an update copy of, of what I'm going to be talking to you about and our financial report and then um, some other stuff in there as well. Um, so thank you all for letting me be here tonight. Um, I think everybody knows who I am, but uh, I'm here on behalf of the Amax Volunteer Fire Department, and uh, I want to make a presentation to you all tonight uh, to help us support our operations. To talk briefly about 2023, uh, we responded to 343 calls for service. Among those, 243 were in the county, 82 were in the town, and 11 were outside of the county. Um, these highlight uh, these numbers highlight the critical role our department plays in ensuring the safety and well-being of our community. So on the next page, highlights our current operating budget. And I've put in there the amount that we receive from the county, which is 57000 and the amount that we receive each year from the town is 27000 I've italicized donations that highlights fifteen to 20000 um, This totals about $84,000. Our operation costs are rising, and uh, we find it challenging sometimes to meet all of our needs within this budget. We rely heavily on public donations. However, these funds aren't always guaranteed. Sometimes we have to make little go far, and sometimes that means that we go without uh, certain items. So my proposed request to you all tonight, and keep in mind that I haven't made the same presentation to the town of Appomattox, so that I still have to... Um, submit this request to them as well. But my request to you all is a $3,000 increase from the county. That would bring your uh, contribution to us each year to $60,000. And then what I will, will be presenting to the town of Appomattox is that they increase to $40,000 annually. And that would bring our budget to $100,000. So it would be a 60-40 split. Um, some of my justification behind that, PPE costs are rising. Uh, it's roughly $4,000 per firefighter for that. Um, equipment costs, just something as simple as a nozzle that we use for fire suppression is roughly $1,000. Um, and we have numerous uh, fire nozzles for our hoses. Um, our insurance costs are rising. $21,000 is our insurance premium this year. Uh, we've shopped around to explore cheaper alternatives for our insurance, but one of the benefits that we have with um, our insurance company, we've, we've reached out to them, especially with recent circumstances with other localities. Um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't have an in, uh, incident where we experienced a total loss of a fire truck, and we had to be searching for a way to pay for that. We didn't want to put that burden on you guys. We didn't want to put that <coughs> burden on the town. Um, so we have that value guard on our insurance policy. So that makes our premium a little bit more elevated, but... It's, it's something that is very necessary. Um, beyond our insurance costs, we've got pumps and hose testing that has to be done annually that can range anywhere from three to uh, $4,000, and then an aerial maintenance cost, which is another uh, $1,000 to $1,500 annually. Our planned expenditures are going to be focused on things that impact the ISO. So when we get audited by the uh, ISO for in homeowners insurance, hose testing, pump testing, and aerial maintenance are all things that fall in line with the ISO specifications in addition to our training. You all addressed the need with us with our training facility that helps greatly um, with the ISO as far as that goes, but beyond all that, other projects will be capable of replacing nozzles. So we're gonna try to replace one to two nozzles a year to help replace the outdated, damaged, or worn fire nozzles. Our PPE that we wear, I referenced that that costs roughly $4,000 per firefighter. That's on a 10-year cycle. It has to be replaced every 10 years. Um, so this increase combined with the town collaboratively will help offset the cost going forward to make sure that we can avoid any kind of large equipment expenditures. We can do that within our operating budget throughout the regular year. The very last thing I have I brought to you guys last year was engine one. Um, we still have a balance of about 130,000, a little bit more than that on our loan for that. So you've got a page that looks like this, um, which is a timeline of events that show from kind of 2020 when we were talking to you guys about this adventure 
um, to let's see, February of last year, um, where the estimated payoff was roughly $135,000. So in addition to the $3,000 increase that I've asked for for our operating budget, I would like for you guys to consider um, giving us a $50,000 payment this year that we would put in a CD um, for F so FY25, and then the next year do another $50,000 that we would then take what's in the CD and apply that towards the balance that's on um, Engine 1. And so the remaining balance of that, we're going to earmark this April any funds that we receive uh, in our mailer fundraiser towards paying off that truck. So our next payment is due in 2025. So if you look down the timeline of events, um, I hope it kind of explains everything in great detail as to why we did what we did. Um, but basically, when we got the $250,000 from the county last in 2022, in August of 2022, we applied two annual payments to push us out to 2025. That equated to $85,084.99. And then we made an additional principal payment of $79,830.02 towards the principal. And that left it roughly at 133000 when you include fees and interest, it puts it at 135, roughly 135,000 on the payoff. The very last page just shows the bank's transactions from Farmers Bank, indicating where we applied those payments. But um, if you've got any questions about any of that, I'll do my best to answer it within my abilities. Try to be respectful to the other folks' time. Well, Mr. Garrett, as usual, you've done a very proficient and professional job of uh, presenting the requirements for the fire department. And appreciate the way you've laid it out in this chronological order. Any other supervisors anything to comment or questions? Yeah, I'll echo what, what you said. Yes, good job. And one thing I missed, okay. uh, that was... Every 10 years, you got to replace something. That's the turnout gear that we wear. Turn, so that, yeah, I got you. Yep. <laughs> so that's got to be replaced every 10 years. And <clears throat> it's credible how they set up an asset replacement plan in their budget. The other thing that is important to me is they are a volunteer organization, which saves the county a lot of money. If we had to fund this as a county-owned operation, we'd be spending millions. I do have a spreadsheet that shows so some of that cost savings, but I didn't they're, bring it tonight. Their dedication is just admirable. <clears throat> Thank you all for what you do and your support. We, we really couldn't do what we do without you all, so we appreciate it. Thank and you. We, and we realize you look out for us. Thank we do you our best. Okay, next up is Ms. Allison Stronza of CAS Virginia. CASA. Good evening. Um, Allison was unable to be here this evening because she's ill. My name is Lorna Rexrode. I'm the Associate Director for CASA. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you this evening. For the, those of you that aren't aware of or familiar with CASA, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. Our mission is to recruit everyday citizens to join our organization as advocates for children who've experienced abuse and neglect. Our staff screens, trains, and supervises each volunteer. The first CASA program was started more than 40 years ago in Seattle, Washington by juvenile court judge David Suko. He didn't feel he had enough information about the children before him in his courtroom to make an informed decision, so he thought of the idea to train everyday citizens to become volunteer advocates. He held an informational meeting and wasn't sure if anyone would show up. But to his dismay, the room was packed. Court appointed special advocates, CASA, was formed, and now more than 950 programs are across the United States. Our program here in Central Virginia was formed in 18, excuse me, 1989 by the late Judge Dale Harris. We served cases in the city of Lynchburg, the counties of Amherst, Appomattox, Bedford, Campbell, and Nelson. CASA of Central Virginia is the third largest program in the state of Virginia. While the children we serve often have a social worker and a, an attorney, a guardian ad litem, those professionals are very busy. They have significant caseloads. While CASA volunteers have only one, sometimes two cases at a time. They can give the child their undivided attention 
and be a great resource for social workers and guardian ad litems. The role of the CASA volunteer is to visit with their child at least twice a month, to build relationships, observe the family dynamics of where they live, listen and document what they, the children's needs and wants are. They also get to know everyone involved in the child's life. Biological parents, foster parents, relatives, teachers. They have access to copies of the children's school records, to their medical records. They monitor the judge's court orders to make sure things are progressing well in the child's case. And they include the information they've gathered in their court report for each hearing. In our meeting with our judges, they tell us, I read the cost report before I read anything else from the <coughs> papers on the desk. Because I know it's most current. I know the CASA volunteers have the ability to spend more time on the cases and get to know the child, and that speaks volumes. Children with a CASA volunteer have much better outcomes. Children with a CASA spend an average of eight months less in foster care, which saves the county money, has fewer placements, do better in school, and receive more services to remedy the concerns that brought them to the court's attention, and are half as likely to reenter foster care. Since 1989, more than 700 volunteers have advocated for over 5,000 children in Central Virginia. When we expanded our program in 2017 to Appomattox County, our initial caseload was small. Now it is our fourth largest caseload after Lynchburg, Bedford, and Campbell. Judge Duncombe, the chief judge of Appomattox Juvenile Domestic Relations Court, appreciates CASA's involvement, especially in the investigative piece of the cases. Like other judges, he references the CASA report frequently in his hearings. Reports help him make an informed decision with information from volunteers whose sole purpose is to advocate for the best interests of the children. He will often give the chance, the CASA a chance to speak in the court and will thank them by name. Last year, Judge Duncan referred 70 Appomattox children to the CASA program in hopes of having a, a CASA volunteer assigned to them. Because of our increased need in Appomattox community, we've been actively been recruiting and happen to have an upcoming eight-week volunteer training class, um, which is going to run through March 14th to May 2nd at the Liberty Baptist Church. And that will be taught by Jason Clark, who lives in this community and also serves the Appomattox community as a CASA volunteer. And we'll be con continuing to have some information sessions to try to increase the number of, of um, advocates in that class. When we expanded Appomattox, we received a federal two-year expansion grant to help us get started. That money, money no longer is available. Because we are a nonprofit organization, we must write grants, ask for donations, hold fundraising events to fund the services of the children for the community. We greatly appreciate the support provided by you in the form of free office space for advocate manager, Kendall Berry, who supervises the cases and the volunteers who serve Appomattox and the $1,000 provided um, for the first time last year. This year, we humbly request your support in the grant request of $3,000 to help offset some of the costs associated with our increased Appomattox caseload, specifically to recruit additional volunteers to serve those cases and the 22 Appomattox children currently waiting for a CASA volunteer. In comparison, all the other counties served by CASA Central Virginia are funded at a much higher rate than the $3,000 that we're asking for. Um, even the counties that we, where we serve fewer children than we do in Appomattox um, provide more funding to us. Like our, Ap Ap oh, excuse me, our Amherst um, funding is um, $4,690, and our Nelson County is $3,500. And then Ca and, um, Campbell County, where we only served one more children than, children than we did last year in Appomattox, was fun we, they funded costs about $8,500. Um, last year, we were able to serve 18 children in Appomattox with the volunteer and staff we currently have. However, 70 children were referred um, and in need of a CASA volunteer. The additional money we are requesting will help us close that gap between the children needing a CASA volunteer and having enough uh, CASA volunteers to serve each of those children. So we appreciate you listening tonight. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those for you. Yes. <clears throat> if 70 were referred and you served 18, Correct. what happened to the other 50? We were un un unable to serve them. Now, as yeah, K K Kendall, as our advocate manager, tries to do everything she can. I'll let her speak yeah. to that. So even though we were not assigned to an actual advocate, I still follow each and every one of those cases. I go to all the court hearings. I go to the court hearings for
Yeah, technically we're supposed to have a volunteer assigned to those cases and then Kendall supervise their work, but she's being pulled in multiple directions trying to do the casework herself, which that's not really supposed to be, you know, her, her role. It's supposed to be supporting the volunteers um, in the, their work. Do the volunteers work with more than one child? They, or is it one-on-one? On one? Normally it's... Normally it's by case. So most volunteers have one case, but some of our volunteers do carry two cases. So it could be, if it's a family group with three, normally it would take the whole family group. Is it a mentoring program like Big Brothers? No, it's more of an investigative. Um, anytime a child comes before the juvenile domestic relation court, he can refer that child to us. We have five court-appointed duties. Um, one is to do an independent investigation. We talk to everybody involved in that child's life. Um, try to gather as much information as possible. We can gather the health records. We can gather their um, school records. Again, just trying to gather as much information as possible. And then they pull all that information together for a court report that is submitted to the judge for every hearing. So the judge has more information to make an informed decision about that child. And they do work collaboratively with social services and with the child's attorney. Um, but they're most basically trying to get to know that child and family as much as possible and gather as much information as possible and then make recommendations to the court as far as what they feel like should happen and then, give again, give him additional information to make the best decision for that child. Their main focus is that best interest of that child. So it's not just going and kind of hanging out. I mean, granted, there's definitely value in the mentorships, but this is more investigative, getting to know the child, getting to know everybody that kind of touches that child's life. So... CASA's focus is structuring the legal entity of the situation the child is in. I would say that's probably a good way to put it. Hmm. Yeah. And they're volunteers. I mean, this is like people get paid to do this kind of work, and they're volunteers. They volunteer their time mm -hmm. to do this. And it's a pretty, it's a, you know, it can be a heavy lift. It's very rewarding work. But you can see families reunited, or you can see children and families get the services they need to remedy the concerns that brought them to the court's attention. If I may, sure. I wasn't I wasn't quick enough to write your name down when you. Um, Lorna Rexroad. Lorna. Yes, L O R N A. Rexroad, R E X R O D. Again. Um, a Lorna L O R N A. Rexroad, R E X R O D, and I'm the associate director. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, your work because my my good friend Cliff Procure in Lynchburg. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. He's been, he's been a CASA volunteer for several years. Yes. We've got volunteers that have been with us for 15 years. Yeah, myself, I just celebrated my 20-year anniversary on staff and had volunteered for 10 years before that. So I've dedicated 30 years to serving the children in our community. So how many volunteers do you have in that max right now? Um, we probably only have like about three right now. And then we, we've got the upcoming training class, and we've got five in the training class. Um, and, and the training class days were March 14th to? Um, March... March 14th to May 2nd, and that's going to be on Thursday nights at the Liberty Baptist Church. We do have a process. Um, if you want to learn more about CASA or anyone does, they can go on our website. We're going to be having information sessions. You have to attend an information session first to learn really more about the role and then apply to become a volunteer. And then we have a background check screening process, go through a phone screening, an in-person interview, and then the eight-week training class. I'm already in meetings with... Cliff on Thursdays, so. All right. I'm sure he'll <laughs> sing our praises, too. Any other supervisors have questions, or? All good. Well, thank you very much for the certainly. your presentation, and uh, well, we'll certainly you. consider it. Thank you. All right, next up is my good friend Sarah Maddox from Piedmont uh, Area of Veterans. And I will state that everything you've heard about her is true. I can vouch for that. <laughs> so, <coughs> first off, thank you. Thank you for your support and your continued support. We <coughs> had a very busy year. Um, we opened, as uh, most of you know, we opened in 2015. We've never owned a permanent home of our own. We've been um, we've occupied a, a, building, a building owned by the town of Barnville, who has graciously allowed us to have it for the last five or six years. We purchased a building in December, 
and I closed on it on the 13th of December. Um, we bought the old Oakwood dealership in Farmville, which gives us a little bit of land. We're moving into that office now. The building, I mean, because it's public information, we paid $400,000 for the building. We had sold another building that we owned for $300,000. We put $205,000 down on the building, which left us very little left. But I know, I know my volunteers. We're a total <coughs> volunteer organization other than my position. And I have dedicated volunteers that have been with me probably nine, nine years. They're very dedicated. They're, most of them are Vietnam veterans or their spouses, and they come in every day and work 40 hours a week with me. Some work more than that. We operate on $50,000, typically, um, and that's from county support, the eight counties that we cover. We raise that much money every year in fundraising, so we try to raise as much as we can without asking the counties for help. We're asking for an increase of, I think, double. I think it's what she put in our budget for this year. If not, $1,000 more than what you approved for us last year. Just so that we can do the repairs to the building um, over the next two years. Our mortgage payments are thirteen oh eight a month. So we owned, I know this is over, we owned another lot that we bought from Larry Atkins. We sold that lot. That lot will pay my mortgage payments for four years. We are going to do yes. fundraising, and my goal is to have the building paid off in two years, and we're debt-free, and I think that's very feasible for us and with the, with the board that I have. Mm -hmm. We needed a new roof, um, new carpet. The building had to be painted. Um, we had to put little things into the building, and I'm proud to say that my volunteers, our total cost was $12,000 in the last two weeks, and we've gotten every bit of it donated to us from other veterans that we've helped. So I'm asking that you consider supporting us again next year, and if you can increase it by $2,000 or $1,000 extra, we would very much appreciate it. Um, Appomattox has become one of, our, one of our busier counties. I think when you look at the veteran population in Appomattox, it's not that we just serve the veteran. We serve the widow. We serve the caregivers. We picked up a program last year, which is a Vietnam veteran program for Vietnam veterans only. And I've, I've done grants for Vietnam veterans in the last six months, and we've raised over $3 million in grants for Vietnam veterans. So that's for house repairs, anything that they could possibly need. Um, with that particular grant, I can pay towards funeral bills. I've been able to help pay funeral bills off for widows that weren't able to pay for their loved ones, their veterans' bills. Um, we are entering, now that we have more space, we have nine offices. Before, we only had four, and we had to, we had to, we had to, leave the building when other when we're using our buildings so we could provide all the programs and services that we wanted to now that we have more space i have the opportunity to bring four more va organizations in so that we will be a full service one-stop facility that a veteran can come or a widow of a veteran and get any benefit done that they need within our building right now the vet center comes up from richmond they do mental health counseling in our building we provide them a space the virginia employment commission comes their devops and their levers use our building um, the Virginia Department of Veteran Services, they come twice a month and do VA benefits for us and resources. Um, we would love to get the service officer from Appomattox, Scott West, <laughs> in Barnville, but I think he's busy already here. But we have the American Legion service officers. I'm going to try to get the DAB and maybe the VFW so that we can increase that service because that's one of our biggest requests for assistance. But we are a full service center, and I'm proud to say that we are a community veteran engagement board. If we are listed on the federal VA website. Um, and what that means, basically, is if a veteran, no matter where they are at in the United States, if they're moving to our area and they pick one of the eight counties that we cover, when they, t when they click on that site on the VA, it automatically sends them to us. We have become well known through the state of Virginia. Um, and right now, we, we used to see 400 veterans, four to 500 a month. We're pushing 700 a month. And that's with a volunteer staff of three or four of us. So I think we're still doing great things, and we'll continue to do it. Any yeah, questions? And I, I, I talk to Scott West at least once monthly, if not more. And, He's and busy. it just, just surprised me, the amount of veterans that even from World War II that never applied for any benefits, didn't know they were eligible, and it's just mind-boggling. I think part of it, too, is in, you know, when the VA started approving caregivers, 
So that opened up not only benefits for the veterans, it opened up benefits for whoever their caregiver was. So our numbers started to increase because everybody was coming in for the PACDAC and caregiver program. I mean, we can go to any nursing home or assisted living and walk down the aisle, and probably there's a lot of women or men that are on Medicaid that we could pull off of Medicaid and put them on a pension program or either file for service-connected compensation and keep them off of Medicaid. But we're busy. <laughs> And then, uh, has there been more thought? I know at one time you were talking about having uh, once a month uh, here at our community center. Is there any more talk about that? Or? We voted to do that. Um, hopefully, we can. Want, hopefully, we'll, we will be moved into the new building by the end of this month. That's our goal. And then we will start full operations again in March. Right now, it's just trying to transition from one building to the other. I'm having to run back and forth to two buildings over the volunteers. But yes, we would do it once a month here. And then I, We'd like I, to increase it to more than that, probably. I have some plans, that, some things I want to do in mathematics and bring some other resources here. Now, you mentioned the outside agencies. I know I'm, I sit on the Central Virginia Workforce Development Board, and they have programs to help veterans, you know, train in that. Does they, I don't know if uh, Prince Edward's part of the Central Virginia branch or not. I am working with Tech for Troops. I don't know if you're familiar for, with them. No. I try to work with predominantly veteran organizations. Tech for Troops wants to come to our area. They offer laptops, um, computer equipment to veterans or to spouses of veterans or to a veteran that's in college at no charge. They want to start doing IT certifications out of our office, which would give employment opportunities. Right now, a lot of the population we see are older veterans, but this way we can service our younger veterans and their spouses as well. And we are a volunteer organization, so I'm proud of my volunteers. I mean. I have Vietnam veterans that come in there and work 40, 50, 60 hours a week with me. At 10 o'clock, they're still there in the building with me when I leave. I think we do a great service. I'll vouch for that. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wolfskill, do you have any questions or comments? I don't. I don't. Very Mr. good Epps. presentation. Thank you. Just appreciate you. Thanks for what you Thank do. You. Thank it's you. Always, it's a highlight seeing you every year, honestly. And I thank you for your support. Yes, I would say the same thing, but I got one question. Mm -hmm. The $7,000 increase is primarily due to what? For the building. Just for, for, for the, the building, building. So that we can keep our doors open while we're trying to fundraise and still provide the programs and the services we currently have. I mean, that's amazing. And we're not asking for it. We're asking for it for just this year and possibly next year. And after that, mm -hmm. back down to what we normally ask for. We, we try not to tax the counties if we can fundraise. I mean, last year at the end of the year, I think we, we pulled in 42000 from fundraising. So we do as much as we can with fundraising so that we don't have to ask for increases and that we can still provide the services without asking for help. You say tax a county. What kind of tax would you ask for from a, a county? From a county. So, so each county participates. I think it might be on our list, but Prince Edward County, yeah, Prince Edward County, the town of Farmville, and Amelia County donate $10,000 a year to us, and they have since we've been open, which is a standard amount for them. Nottaway County has not supported us in the last two years. I am going to Nottaway County board meeting to ask them for assistance this year. And then Cumberland and Buckingham and Appomattox have. Now, you said approximately X amount of veterans are here in Appomattox utilizing your facility. Do you have any idea I can get about, you ain't going to be exact by no means, but I want to say that the last report that we had between veterans, caregivers, and family members, we were getting 70 to 80 calls every two weeks for mathematics. And that wasn't necessarily for benefits. It was for resources or assistance with us filing grants for them. I know I just did a grant for two veterans here to pay for repairs to their homes. Okay. And the grants can go up to twenty or thirty thousand dollars per per veteran. Well, it's good that you have the resources that can provide that service. It's a volunteer staff. Yeah. And I'm I am constantly cultivating new relationships and new partnerships to increase our services. And right now, and I know I just got asked to sit on a um, panel for the state of Virginia. Community veteran engagement boards. I think there's five in the state of Virginia. I started the first two in Virginia, um, but they're in every state. We were recognized as one of the 
role models to go back with community veteran engagement boards because we are a full service center. And if you look in the state of Virginia for a full service veteran center, we're the only one. All right, Ms. Max, thank you for your presentation and all that you do. Thank you. And I know that I think Scott sees about 10, 15 veterans a month here in Appomattox. Well, Scott does hearings as well. So we just started doing some of the hearings too to take some of the work from him. But thank you. Thank you, Ms. Madden. All right, next up we have the Virginia Legal Aid Society. Mm -mm. Nobody present from the Legal Aid Society? Nope. That's my one. <laughs> Raw delight. She wasn't coming in. Yeah. All right. Paul Robertson. Mm. can read that at your leisure. After that, we have our Commissioner of Revenue, Ms. Sarah Henderson. Which hopefully you're going to tell us that vehicle values went up 800 percent. Yeah. All right, thank you all for allowing me to speak with you on behalf of the Commissioner of Revenue's office budget. The following was requested when we turned in our budget for FY25. Um, professional services. Um, J.D. Power valuing of vehicles. J.D. Power has suspended their service directly to commissioners of the revenue, effective 1-1-2024. We had to contract with a third-party vendor to get our values from J.D. Power. We contracted with Avenity as they were the only software company that agreed to do the service for localities that did not have their software. J.D. Power has to be used because it is the recognized pricing guide that all localities use throughout Virginia. This caused a significant increase per record because we have to pay for every lookup and it's mass valuing, of course. Um, number two, increase of 5% for BAI support for our software. Um, the treasurer, Vicki Phelps, spoke with Jackie Norton, representative for Bright, and she said for us to budget 5% increase for FY 2025. Salaries. Um, our association, Commissioner Revenue Association, in our proposed legislative agenda, have asked for a 4% across the board cost of living increase. And they're asking effective 7 1 2024. Of course, that's the General Assembly that they're asking. Um, also, the Commissioner Revenue Association is asking the General Assembly to restructure the population bans for Commissioner of the Revenue, the constitutional officer, so that the lower population bans will be lumped with the higher pay population ban at the 40,000 to 69,999 population and the salary increased accordingly. This is asked because the smaller localities do the same scope of work that the larger localities. And the Sheriff's Association was effective getting that done through their association and that was effective on December 1, 2023. And that's all that, that we are requesting. Um, we respectfully ask that these items be incorporated in the budget to accept all that the Commissioner Revenue Association is successful in securing. And that's all I have. Any questions? Mr. Wesco, any questions? I do not. Mr. Hips? Mr. Carter? Yes, I do. Uh, the $274,562 increase on salaries and wages, and that that includes the four percent, mm -hmm. and it also includes that restructuring pay ban for the yes. constitutional officer. Yes. So this, in turn, doesn't reflect what the general assembly gave in what December or January. It I actually forgot. is going to be a little more than that because we didn't have those figures. So it would be actually a little bit more than that if that all passes okay. with the, in the general assembly. Because the, the figure that I had on the on the constitutional officers uh, pay was before the December one uh, increase. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Thank you. Hmm. All right, Ms. Phelps, our treasurer. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to come up here and discuss my budget. And I, like Sarah, have um, put an increase in the salary and wages, and that is due to the increase that Sarah is talking about, the Commission of Revenues, when they're lumping into that uh, larger population. They're, they're talking, uh, they've also proposed it from the Treasurer's Association to legislature also. So I have included that in that salary increase that, um, that you'll see that I turned in. I mainly put that in there so that you can see what it would look like, what it's going to look like, because come July, if it's approved, then I don't know whether it'll be passed or not, but I like for to keep you um, just and give you the knowledge so that you'll know that it, it's a possibility. I did the same thing with my uh, employees. I um, put a 4% increase on their salaries as well. And that figure, that 217.050, that is including up in the treasurer's salary to that pay band and a 4% increase for the, for the employees. That's, you know, that's um, whether it's approved through legislature or not. But anyway, I went ahead and put it so you could kind of see what we would be looking at if it is approved. Um, so I just I just went ahead and requested the 4% increase for employees in the event that this proposal is approved. Um, I also called and uh, are there any questions about the salary thing? I, I, I do have um I'm not sure if I include it with my budget, but where the Treasurer's Association sent out a memo, and if you need to see it, I'll be glad to give it to you. Just what they're proposing to legislature as far as the employees and their um, and the, the Treasurer. So if anyone would like to see that, I can uh, send it to you. The other increases that I have um, is the 5% increase in data processing. I spoke with uh, Jackie Norton at BAI, and that's what she said, too. Um, would just be to um, budget for a 5% increase on, on Bright. Um, postage, um, I went back and I, I got Ms. McCormick to run me an expenditure report on postage because I wasn't real sure what to do and how it's been running. But when I got the, I didn't realize that it was, I was over as much as I was. And when I looked at 2023, I realized how much over expenditure it was on postage. So that's why I've upped it to 30,000, um, just because we do mail out tax tickets twice a year. We do mail out delinquent tickets twice for each one twice a year. And my employees, when we get, we get lots of return mail, what they do is they sit and they research and they try to find another, another address. They get on the internet, they look, they find a different address. We will continue to resend every returned envelope uh, tax bill that we get. If it continues to come back, we will continue to look for an address. We try to send everything as many, you know, just to see if we can find someone until we know we've run exhausted everything we can. And, and then we also had a postage increase. It, I, I looked at what has been spent for 2024, and it doesn't look like that much. However, we... We just sent out de uh, delinquent tickets that I think we're just paying now. So, um, and then you would have tickets that'll go out again in May. So, after all those tickets go out, we may be looking at spending almost that much again. So, it, it, I just really don't have a way to know exactly how much I'm going to spend until those tickets, <clears throat> excuse me, are mailed out. But that is the reason for the for the postage increase and. Other than that, I, I did not ask for an increase. I, I don't see that we need it. I, I feel like we, we've been trying to stay within the budget um, as best we can. So. Do we have like a special bulk rate postage rate, or do we? Have we do. We okay. have a um, yes, we do. <coughs> Even at that, it's still. Yeah, it doesn't I, take long to. I see where first class is going to sixty-eight cents. It's, I believe it's already gone up. It went up in January, and it may be going up again. I'm not sure, but I know it went up in January. So, But we, we, are, we have a um, postage machine, so we use that. Now, I'm, now, we do not mail out from my office all the tax 
uh, bills. They are mailed from a printer, but they still get the discount, but we have to pay the printer, so that's how that works. But, um, okay. Any questions, I'd be glad to answer what I can. If I can't, I'll try to find out for you. Um, any I questions would. questions from the board? I got one, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and this is somewhat of a frivolous question, okay? <laughs> uh, is it possible or feasible? Even uh, Ms. Henderson, y'all send out y'all's tax tickets pretty much the same time. I'm or, the only one that sends tax tickets. Okay. And Ms. Henderson sends out. She doesn't send anything to do with tax tickets. Okay. I do. That all comes out of my office. Okay. I told you it'd be frivolous. No, that's <laughs> um, I did want to report, too, that I did run a, um, a tax report before I left this afternoon. And um, right now it looks like for, the, for 2023, we are at like 91% of collections for personal property at 97% for real estate. Now, we will be... Uh, DMV stops will go on uh, February the 20th. So that will bring in and up that cost, I mean, that money, the funds for personal property. Because once that DMV stop is placed on their, their social, then they can no longer get their vehicle registration or anything done until they pay their taxes. Also, I have been talking with General District Court and we are working to um, to do the warrant and debts. I know you had asked me about that, and so um, we are trying to get together our list, the paperwork, and I have talked to Ms. Hamlet, and she's hoping to set a day aside, just a one day, and, and hear just our, you know, our uh, warrants that are just for taxes, because we have quite a few that can be heard, so... I think we'll set a day aside and try to get that taken care of, you know, and get that. So we will do that. I had said I was going to do debt set off this year. It, it has not worked through my computer system yet. I'm, I haven't given up. I'm still working on it. But um, that's just a process that I'm still working with and trying to get everything approved and get it ready. And as soon as I get that ready to go, it will. I will be doing debt set off, which is where you go to department taxation. And if they have... I guess lottery money or um, taxes, it would pull from that. We wouldn't be first choice. I think um, you kind of go down the, um, the the line of the importance, and then, uh, but we would be able to get some collections that way. However, I feel like with what we're doing, our collections look really good. I did compare them to last year. We are just a little bit above what we were doing last year. Um, which is always a good sign. So I hope, you know, once these DMV stops go on, that will increase the funds for the personal property. So any questions or anything you'd like I to see? I see you hired do? a new assistant. I did. Yeah. That's my grandson, Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> He's keeping me straight tonight. Is, that, is, he my, is he my neighbor? Excuse me? Is this the one that's close to me? On Stonewall? No, it's not. Oh, okay. He lives over on a farm in... Uh, that's his cousin. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have um, I have seven assistants. <laughs> well, thank you, Ms. Phelps. We thank you. Appreciate the job you do in collecting all those taxes you. in yeah. your office. It. I have to say, it, I have a staff that's on top. Boy, they are after it. They are great at what they do. They know their job. They do their job, and they're they're willing to learn to do what needs to do. I don't know if any of you are aware, but five years ago, this office was behind considerably in, in things. And this office has picked up, and they are, um, we are trying to be on time every month unless there's a reason. Um, but that comes from having an excellent staff, and I have to give them all the credit because they are an excellent staff. Well, I'd have to say you all are a breath of fresh air. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. 
And that just proves I made the right vote four years ago. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so no further questions? Thank you. I Thank appreciate you. it. Well, let's see. And Commonwealth attorney, are we expecting him? Yeah, we're actually at the end of the schedule. 30, 30 minutes ahead of schedule. Are we? Yeah. yeah. And that the one guy didn't show up. Well, he should, he should be here. Oh, you want Jeff to go ahead yeah. and do this? Yeah, I'm going to say, why don't we let Jeff go ahead? <laughs> Wanted All to right, Jeff. we have high expectations. <laughs> so. Hey, Mr. Shepard. Oh, man, Jeff. Come <laughs> dazzle us with your floor show. <laughs> I figured oh, yeah. I'd come before y'all tonight uh, just to see how it's done, but uh, y'all have a copy of my budget up there. Uh, basically, and I read my appropriated funds wrong, I'm looking to increase my maintenance budget from three fifty to 400000 for this year coming up. Basically, what I was looking at, uh, we got a 20-year-old chiller on top of that courthouse that's pushing 20 years old. Uh, there's really, we maintain and keep a check on oil samples. We keep a check on the glycol. We do a, twice a year, we do a maintenance program on it. Uh, but what I want to try to do is, as we go down through our budget, uh, we have some motors I'm starting to replace up on the top of the courthouse roof. Uh, the courthouse is our biggest, basically our number one expense we got to deal with on a daily daily basis, uh, just maintaining that big building. Uh, we're starting to see wear and some of our valving throughout the courthouse coming from the chiller and the boiler. We've got a 20-year-old boiler sitting up there. Everything's working, but we had, there comes a time and date where, you know, we're going to have a failure. And on the courthouse, we don't have much time to fix anything because of the court dates. So I've added 50,000 from a maintenance, uh, come on down to like our landscape and I've added another 5,000 onto that. Uh, as we look around the, the courthouse square, uh, landscaping needs to be improved. We got some sidewalks that need to be improved. Uh, coming on down through, uh, the biggest other thing we're going to do is uh, looking at, for my guys, is our tour alignment. I jumped that up $500 because I got myself and Dane, which is my understudy, and then we have Willie, which is basically does all of our groundkeeping, and he's pretty much maintaining his equipment, all the lawnmowers and stuff out there at the park. I need to get more toilet. It's hard to have mm -hmm. one service truck, three bed. <laughs> I mean, it's mm -hmm. we get scattered sometimes and bring it all back. 50, 50. But uh, the safety equipment, uh, we do have the aerial lift there. I need to get each one of those guys certified on it, and each one of those guys need to have their own harness. Uh, according to OSHA, we can't share our harnesses and safety equipment like when we get in an aerial bucket. Uh, the, other, the other big thing I need to do is I got a 2006 F-150, and it's running about 240,000 miles on that truck. Okay. It's starting to smoke. It needs some repair. We run it. It runs every day. I like to get rid of that truck and find me a nice use, like a one-ton dump truck. Uh, basically, uh, we need a dump truck in around the park. Anytime we need to get stone, we're shoveling, and then we're loading on the pickup truck, shoveling off. Uh, if we need to get a heavier trailer, if we need to move the tractor to the park, we got to do a lot of work this year at the park. Uh, do the trail over uh, the, the road between the, the uh, uh, back at the car wash down there to the to the trail. We need to keep that. We need to rework that a little bit. Uh, just maintaining in around the park out there uh, would be nice to have a smaller dump truck. Get rid of a truck to get that truck. I don't want a new one. I want, I want to try to like, clean 2016, 2018 truck just to do daily chores, uh, to pull the trailer, you know, a half-ton pickup truck or a three-quarter ton pickup truck with two mowers on it. You, got, you know you got a load behind you. Um, but all said and done, um, when it's all at the end of the year, end of the budget, if I have any money left, if we could put that in the CIP fund, not in the general fund. 
So if I have a catastrophic failure on the boiler or if I have it on the chiller or something in around the county, I already had appropriated funds available to make that purchase. Um, my motors that I used to buy at $700 are $1,100 now. I mean, everything is just escalating up. And it's just a constant cost. And that's, uh, that's what I work with every day. I mean, we just, we're just steadily making repairs and keeping the lights on and trying to stay ahead of the game. But, you know, it's, the, challenge is, the challenge is beyond behind us. I mean, it started years ago, and we're, trying to, we're catching up. We're getting better. And uh, we finally got some good guys that here every day, stay late every day, and they, they don't complain whatever we put in front of them they work at. And that's just my spiel for tonight. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Shepard? Great job. Mr. Thank Shepard. you. All. Sammy, you good? No. No. Okay. Mr. Hicks? You're good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Sheriff, we're ahead of schedule. There's, I don't see anybody waiting to jump in line. So if you'd like to do your presentation now, we'd accept that. Ooh, individual manila folders. That looks oh, like homework. Yeah. Oh, thank you, sir. Listen. <laughs> Just listen. <laughs> yeah, don't bill me for it, please. <laughs> Everybody ready? First off, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Fellow board members, thank you all for having me. I am asking for a few things tonight, but everything that I'm asked for is, is very needed. Um, and I also got to apologize after looking at small records. It looked like I went out of formality and I didn't present it exactly given some details of what I was asking for before I got here, but I'll go over each thing detailed pretty good, and if you've got any questions, just let me know. Uh, the first thing I'd like to bring to your attention, um, 5801, dues and memberships. Uh, you have a, in your hands an expenditure worksheet. I assume you all have the same one that I had. It shows the past few years, and it's basically, it hasn't gone up since at least the last three years, and we're already over overdue now with those budgets and what that comes from a lot of it is uh the central virginia criminal justice academy has gone up and also the drug task force has gone up uh it really hurt us when we send people to the academy which is within the past year have sent two different people and they didn't make it so we pay for those people on top of the other ones we're sending to the academy so you can't really waiver what it's going to cost but it's at least 400 dollars per deputy to keep them certified each two years so that's going up i'm, I'm asking uh for that to be raised uh, five thousand dollars, 
And the reason being is we've been running, to my knowledge, we've been running a negative in that pretty much every year. This is to catch us up with that so we don't have to run a negative and try to find it from some other line item that we need to save from to keep it up, um, to pay for it. Uh, the second line item, uh, 7005, which is their vehicle and uh, motor vehicle and equipment. And uh, to my knowledge, years ago, the, the board approved us to have three vehicles. The unfortunate thing with that is we do have enough money to, to buy three vehicles. And if you look in the first paper clip you get to, it's a basically a quote of what one vehicle cost, which will be the back end from Don Franklin Auto. Now, granted, it's a $215,000 bill, but that's what we pay with our ARPA money this year. But one vehicle, as you can see, would be $42,308. And if you times that by three, and then you add the labor, which is on the second sheet, is what it costs to outfit a vehicle. We don't have enough in that line item to pay for all three vehicles to be equipped with lights, sirens, and radios. We just have enough to pay for the, the vehicles, and then we can afford one to maybe two outfits with that. So what I'm asking for in that line item is to be uh, $29,780 to be added, and that's basically rounded up to the figure, if you, if you do the math, to a total of $173,000. So each year that we get three vehicles, they can be outfitted the way they need to be. Any questions on that one? Uh, the third line item, it's, it's kind of two combines, 5503 and 5504. Um, I would like to ask if the board could, if they combine them as one. Uh, they're both for training. And, one's training and lodging, and the other one's convention, education, training. So one's kind of food and travel, stuff like that. But it's, it's basically combined into one. It's just two, item, two line items. If they can't be, I'd like to raise both of them to $10,000. We've got to do better training to these officers to better equip them for this county. Right now, we have enough to provide to them basically to go to a train to trainer class, which is basically somebody's read over the book and can teach them what they need to, to teach instead of somebody who's an expertise in the field that they need to go to. We need to give these guys better training in narcotics. You know, one of the things I've, I've ran on is stopping the distribution of fentanyl and methamphetamine. You know, it's hard to do that when they don't, they aren't trained on what to look for, the indicators and stuff like that on interdiction work. These are things that can only be taught through the expertise of somebody that is certified to do it. They get their basic knowledge in a criminal justice academy class, but as we're seeing now more and more, that's not suffice enough for the courts. So they have to have better training, which is i.e. through a, a, a more sophisticated class to be able to testify as being an expert witness in the narcotic field. Um, and, and as we've seen as well is these classes, they used to cost $200 to $350 just an entry fee, and they're now they're going up to anywhere from $600 to $1,000, and that's just for the entry fee. That doesn't include what it costs for a hotel room, which we all know since COVID has doubled or tripled in price. And, and we haven't, these line items haven't gone up since COVID, <clears throat> at least to my knowledge in the past three years of what I have in front of me. So I'm, I'm asking for either combining those lines and making a $20,000 line item or $10,000 per, which... However you want to look at it, same thing to me. But it's just to better equip them. And, and I'll go along with saying the last thing that, I, that I'm going to ask for is there's no point in raising this if we don't get the last one because I don't have enough deputies to give the other deputies off to go to classes. So right now they're having to do online training while they're working just to make sure they get their credits in because we can't let them off to go to these classes. And if we do, we've got to pay somebody overtime to basically come out and work for them because we don't have anybody else to work. The last one, which, you know, I think the word's pretty much been out. is the biggest one I'm, I've come to ask for. Uh, but it's the most important piece. The request would be for $260,636.56. That would cover four deputies completely with salaries. I would not be asking for any more money for uni uniforms, no more money for equipment, no more money for vehicles other than what is already allotted, allotted that I've asked for, just the outf outfit, the ones we've already been asked for, which is just three. Anything else, I wouldn't be asking for. The only thing that I'm asking is just to do this is I'll, I'll take the rest of it on me. The vehicles, I'll make it work. Somehow, know the budget I have, I'll make it work if I can get four more deputies. Uh, the sheriff's office has been working with a bare minimum for way too long. Uh, I've, we've created a video for you. What this video is going to show you is what it's like to be a deputy at nighttime where everybody else is sleeping 
And this is what it's like on just several occasions. And this is just a couple that they pulled and made a video for us. And it shows what's happening at nighttime. And just understand there's only two deputies working this county at nighttime. And I'm going to go into the, a few basically scenarios afterwards how this county is only being protected by one person. In some cases, none. Because we only have two guys working. Nathan, if you don't mind hitting play. I can sit up here and talk all day, but visual, visualization is the best thing that could ever happen. Because if that doesn't show you what happens every night and how they need help, then nothing else will. You know, there's three big things that contribute to these things, and, and it's not only this county, but the state mental health system is broken, has been broken. And unfortunately, law enforcement continue to take the hit of it. They depend on us to do everything and anything when it comes to mental health, when it comes to sitting with individuals in need of desperation of, of some kind of mental facility. Just this past weekend, we had a TDO. The individual on the way to the hospital, it was a rescue, rescue call. That's how it started off. And he assaulted the law and rescue worker. Got to the hospital and, and tried to rape a nurse. We were then uh, given a TDO, which was a temporary detention order, which means we have to sit with that individual until a bed becomes available at a mental health facility. There was no bed available. We were the 31st on 40 on the list. The only thing that helped us was a medical doctor stepped in and said he needs more medical help right now than he needs anything, and we got to put him in ICU. And they lifted it. Other than that, we would have been sitting on that TDO till this day and until the 31st came number one, in which, according to them, they said they had no idea when that would be. When they become combative, they can't look for another bid. It's got to be a state hospital. So, therefore, we're only on one waiting list, and that's it in the entire state. And that's that you know, western state more than likely. So we have to sit there and wait until a bid becomes available. And a lot of times it's when it, after the TDO runs out. But how do you leave this individual? Even the TDO runs out. He just did what he did to a rescue worker and to a mental, I mean, a um, hospital nurse. How do you leave that person alone? You can't. So therefore, we have to sit with them 24-7, which then takes another deputy off the road. So we have to find somebody to come in and work for that deputy. And a lot of times it's hard to find them. They don't get a lot of times off when they do. They spend all their family and they're gone somewhere. So we have to do something to where one of the supervisors steps up and we all come out and try to chip in. But we're, we're running out of help, and we're running them thin because we're working them to death. So we got to give them some help. You know, the, the second thing is it's, it's hard for them to be proactive. They make a traffic stop. As you saw, they make a traffic stop on a DUI. So if you saw the officer is by himself already, he just made a DUI arrest. So then there's nobody for the entire county because the one deputy was already in, uh, helping out on the ECO at the hospital. So the supervisor is working by himself to find somebody in the middle of 460 drunk, and he arrests them. Therefore, there's nobody else to work this county. We've got to call somebody in and hope somebody answers it, as you saw, 2.43, 3 o'clock in the morning. And it's hard enough to get them when it's daylight, much less 2.33 in the morning. Uh, you know, the, the third thing, and again, being proactive, it's hard to be, as I preached earlier, trying to stop the distribution of meth, uh, meth and fentanyl in this county. How can you expect these guys to search vehicles when they know it's going to take two to three hours making that arrest, and they're going to leave their partner alone by themselves, and they can't protect these citizens? So we've got to give them help. It's not only for the deputy, but it's for the citizens of this county. You know, the third thing is our radio system. As we all know, we've been working diligently on that thing for the past two to three months. Hopefully, we finally come to a common agreement on that. But at the same time, as we still have radio systems that are not as great as they should be right now. And we, at one point last year, had to sit and talk on um, cell phones. That's the only means of communication that we had was cell phones. Sounds like it's my dad telling about stories back in the 70s when he had to pick up a phone when the light was on. You know, we are too far gone from that, and we're working on the radio system, so, you know, that's coming along. But until then, the only way to fix that is giving them more help so they don't have to call for help. The help is right there with them when they need it. That's the big thing. You know, I could go on and on with more scenarios. Again, I think that video speaks for itself. Not only do the great citizens of this county deserve this, the deputies deserve this. I don't want to have to go to somebody's house and tell their loved ones they're no longer here because we couldn't help them. I know it seems like a big figure, but it's really not, it's nothing compared to what a life would be. We've got to do something to protect these individuals, protect the citizens of this county, and it's by giving more deputies to us. So I appreciate it. You know, if you got any questions, there's one thing I didn't address that I'd like to go back, but has anybody got any questions on that one? The only one that I, as, as y'all saw, I made you a little cheat sheet in the front about everything that I was asking for. The last one was a 5408 in the vehicle equipment and gasoline supplies. Is that in 10,000 of that? Unfortunately, as we all saw, the, the, uh, the fuel lines were coming down, uh, the price per gallon, but unfortunately, she's going back up, and, and who knows after the election what it could be next year. 
Uh, and if we get four more deputies, that's one thing me and Miss Adams talked about. There's something I can't change. If we got four more deputies, it is going to be more fuel that's used on the road. I mean, it's just simple math. So I asked for $10,000 added to that, which totaled in $160,000. So I come to you today with a total of adding four deputies, and those few you know, lines that I asked to, uh, to go up on is $316,416.56. Which I know looks like a lot, but I feel like it's a drop in the bucket for what we're truly asking for. Sure, because a lot of that training increase cost, basically, um, it sounds like you know it's mandated from the state that we only use their instruct only their instructors are capable of training this stuff, and so it puts us kind of in a do or do or can't situation. I wouldn't say it's a mandate, but if we want convictions in court, now I'm sure the Commonwealth attorney would be a whole lot happier if they were. Are trained on what they're doing. Yeah, well, to me, it's a unmandated mandate. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Gill, you got questions? The primary responsibility of any government is the safety of the citizens. To me, everything we saw tonight is very important, but the primary thing of any government is the safety of its citizens, and we need to make sure that our sheriff's department gets everything he needs. And he's, he's scrutinized these numbers. I know we've been in conversations several times. He's scrutinized the numbers. He's not asking for anything exorbitant. Biblically, it says two by two, not one by one. Our deputies are out there many times in harm's way. Not to mention what happens to the citizens because we don't have deputies to get around. Personally, I think you should have eight more deputies, not four. But I just want to say that. I would completely agree with you. I, I didn't want to set my goal extremely too high. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it is needed. I mean, in reality, it is needed. One more thing I'd like to say that he didn't say tonight. We were in a conversation two weeks ago and just... In passing, I said, so, <clears throat> how many drug arrests do you make a month? And he said, weekly. But then he finished that with, it could be infinite. If I had the manpower, I could make so many arrests that I couldn't count them. Stuff isn't happening because we're not providing the resources to our sheriff's department to make it happen. This is a number we need to crunch, and we need to make sure the sheriff's department gets everything that they're asking for. Appreciate you. And, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in my little kid dreams, I wanted to be a cop, but man, after saying, after saying that sort of stuff and, you know, through life, seeing the things that you guys put up with, it's amazing. It's amazing that you guys do it. I know it's a, a mission and a calling, you know, and uh, I really, Appreciate it. I think the restraint, even on the first one, he tackled the guy rather than tasing him, right? Yep. I wouldn't have been so generous. So I think that's, <laughs> I mean, stuff like that, just the, the restraint's amazing. It's, it's great. And I really appreciate you guys and I uh, appreciate your presentation. And, and back to the training, one of the things that Sheriff shared with me, because of the budget constraints and time and time constraints, the deputies he, he can't spare them to go training. They're doing video training instead of real training, which is barely minimal. I mean, I think we all understand if somebody's watching a computer screen how much you're truly learning. You know, <coughs> hands-on training is a heck of a lot better than sitting at the computer screen just watching it. <coughs> You've done a good job, yeah, he did. Sheriff. Done a good job on this. But uh, let me remind Mr. Wolfskill, this is nothing, nothing new. This has been going on for years. And the BOS can only do so much, mm -hmm. only so much money to go around. Mm -hmm. I understand but we'd that. like to give him a, the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, but we can't do it. Well, but again, primary responsibility of any government is the safety of the citizens. Well, yeah, everybody knows that. That's right. Well, then it shouldn't go on anymore. Well, Mr. Carter, one thing I'd like to speak about on that is being on the Public Safety Committee. You know, not speaking numbers, <coughs> but I definitely coincided with 
a decision that we did with this in mind of saving this county a pile of money in hopes it could be used for these deputies and the safety of these citizens. Yep. Well, Sheriff Richardson, I thank you for your presentation, and, and it reminds me that that's nothing's changed as a patrol officer back in the 70s being the only one on the road at 2 and 3 a.m. in the morning. I can relate, and the same thing is they don't want to pay. They want the safety, but government has a tendency to find other things more important than the Sheriff's Department, which I totally disagree with. Yeah, no, and the one thing I want to leave you with is, is one of the things I can say for all the deputies, and I went to each one of them just, if I didn't talk to all of them, it was the majority of them, and they all said that they would rather have more deputies than more pay, and they're already underpaid, and for them to say that means a lot. And it's got to set with, if, if they need more help, they need more help. It shouldn't take one of them getting hurt before we realize they need it. Amen to that. Thank you all for, for your time. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Mr. Fleet, front and center, please. There he is. <laughs> All right. If I, it, this is uh, unsolicited. Before I get started, if I could just reiterate a little bit of what uh, the, the sheriff said and actually, um, Mr. Hinkle, what you stated also is uh, your prior experience as a law enforcement officer. Uh, I would say from personal experience as a former police officer myself back in the early 80s, um, I remember going to a domestic call, uh, being young, full of vinegar, and not so full of common sense, and uh, thinking that I'd just been out of the Marine Corps about a year and a half, and I, I could tackle the world went to a domestic call. It was a sergeant from the Department of Corrections and his wife. I didn't wait for backup. Uh, they were on the other side of the city. And by the, and so I went in because I heard the, the shouting. He was, he was pounding the living daylights out of her. And, and I went and laid my hands on him. We were starting to tussle. And then he broke free from me. And over on the couch, which was on the other side of the room, was a 357 Magnum, and he was making a beeline for that. I went to grab him. I get the wife, who was the victim, jumping on my back, wailing on me. And if it hadn't been for my back, <coughs> the door at that time, I might not be standing here today. So those guys, uh, you know, my hat's off to them. Um, you know, I, I, I personally would not be doing it. Of course, I'm also a lot older and hopefully a lot wiser, um, but um, my hat's off to him. And as the, the, the chief prosecutor for the, the, the county, they do bring me good cases. Uh, I'd like to see more good cases, um, but first and foremost, I want to see them go home at night. At the end of the shift. I don't care about the cases. I want to see them home with their families, okay? All right. The only caveat oh. I'd add to that is Back when I was on the road, you could hit him in the head with a six cell and not not get <laughs> well, arrested, I, charged with I, abuse I, I, for that. Let's just say we had blackjacks. So not a recorded in, in painting. Our, our pocket, so <laughs> it was a different world. Hey, we were thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, on on that note, uh, I I thank all of you for for allowing me to speak before you tonight and and to just um, explain my budget request for this coming year. Um, if, if you'll notice, um, in the, the, the biggest item that I'm asking for is um, my actually my newest prosecutor who is, I guess she is a quasi grant position, full-time position. She was, uh, she's the grant position the, the domestic violence grant position that we've had for years and previously held by Dana Smith, who left. Uh, Lauren um, it was hired. Um, you, uh, the board graciously, I think, was it maybe about three years ago, two, three years ago, agreed to supplement and make that a full-time position. 
Um, and so that's, that's what we did. We took uh, money that we had from the comp board, well, not from the comp board, but we took money that, that um, you had allotted for a part-time paralegal to add on to that, and then you added a little bit more to that to make it a full-time uh, position. And I believe that the current salary is $65,100. Um, that sounds like a whole lot of money, but with the December raises that the comp board came up with, and I'm not talking about the 2%, I'm talking about across the board pay raises uh, for uh, due to a salary study, um, that uh, a beginning or uh, attorney one uh, now is up to $73,500. Um, the other full-time assistant that I have, not the deputy, not Kia, uh, but the other full-time position that we have is a comp for a uh, board funded position. Uh, he bumped up to the 73.5 and then with the 2% and then with the stipend that uh, or the uh, supplement that the county uh, uh, provides for uh, that position, he's up to around 77,000, I think. Um, Lauren obviously is considerably under that now. Lauren has twice the experience that John does. John's a good prosecutor. John is learning. I'm very happy. I, I, I'm happy with all, all the prosecutors in the office. But what I would like to do is take $8,400 and add to that to bump her up to the base minimum for a full-time assistant one, which is the 73.5. Now, that's not additional money that the, that the board is going to have to come up. That's already in my budget. Because the board has a supplement, uh, had a supplement on Cindy Williamson, my, my long-term office manager, um, the, the, the board supplemented her salary. I would like to, to transfer most of that supplement to Lauren's salary. There will be a little bit left, or I think there's probably going to be about $700 left over. Um, and I'll give that back to the county. I mean, I, I, the, the, the new office manager I have, the comp board has raised the, the, the starting salary for that to where she's making a, a, a good salary for her level of experience. So uh, I don't plan on adding a supplement uh, that was formerly Ms. Williams's to, to that, that, um, that. So um, that's the biggest thing. The other, the other, um, if you look at my budget request, um, it's level. Uh, the only uh, increase I asked for is an additional $500 added to office supplies. So from $3,500 to $4,000. And the, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious why. I mean, the prices just keep going up. Um, our discovery obligations to defense attorneys has gone up. Um, we are getting inundated with jury trials. Uh, that seems to be the new game plan for defense attorneys. So we have more jury trials, um, actually, uh, than, than we ever have had. Uh, we probably, we have scheduled uh, anywhere, on average, probably two jury trials a month. We only have four criminal days in circuit court a month. Sometimes we'll, we can get the judge to come, come up an extra day uh, for, a, for a fifth day. But um, all in March, we have five criminal days. Four of those days are taken up by, by jury trials in the month of March. Jury trials take a whole lot more paperwork. We've got jury instructions you have to do. There's a lot more prep that you have to do. There's more discovery given to defense attorney. So. Our actual cost for office supplies is probably going to be greater than the $500, but I'm willing to take that $500. We do have a, I think, uh, some part-time money that we get from the comp board that, that, that gets reimbursed every year. Um, and, and so if I have to draw on that to make up um, for, for office supplies by the end of the year, I, I can do that. But... I'm only off uh, asking for $500 
uh, increase for that. And you'll notice for the advertising, which is line 30, uh, 3007, um, that was a $500 budget. Um, I'm asking that to be zeroed out. Uh, I, I don't need that $500. Now, it's not because I don't believe I might not ever have to advertise again, but I have other avenues that I can advertise for open positions where I don't have to pay the exorbitant prices that the, that the newspaper uh, requires. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm a, just asking the, the, the board to call, go ahead and zero that out. So actually, um, my budget for fiscal year, what is it, 2025, is actually less than what it was this year. So um, that's that's my, my my pitch for the night. So if anybody has any questions, be more than happy to answer. But that's that's my request uh, that that the money um, be shifted from from one position to another position, so I can bring. That, that attorney one position up to a salary that is uh, uh, comparable to the experience uh, that, that she brings to the table. Well, Mr. Fleet, I do have one question. Yes, sir. If I heard you right, you said your new proposal, your 2025 request is less than the FY24. Well, the sheet I'm looking at, the FY24 was a total of 553,000 and change and it says the 25 request totals to 641,000. Yes, sir. But that's not from the, 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 the money that I'm requesting from the county. That's all the state monda mandated on okay. salaries, benefits, and, and all that, which, as you know, we have, we have some control over. But, you know, when they say this is what the base is for people, so that, that's where the increase is. Okay. Thanks for that clarification, sir. Yes, sir. Any questions from the board? Mr. Wesco? No. Thank you for your hard Thanks, work. Boss. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Fleet. Appreciate Thank you, it. sir. I appreciate the hard work you do for the county. Well, I, I, and I thank you for uh, those compliments. And uh, I will, if it's okay with the board, I will relay those uh, to the staff. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I see Miss Bloodworth came into the room, so if you're ready, you can come on up. Okay, well. A little earlier than expected, but may I approach and hand you the worksheets? You certainly may. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Brandon. And everyone was supposed to be here at 745. I was to present. You're going to hurt somebody. I know, right? <laughs> it's eight o'clock. Well, we're actually ahead of schedule. Yours. You're right. <laughs> Should we wait for the rest of your team to oh, arrive? That is totally up to you. Well, it's the pleasure of the board wait for the rest of her team to arrive rather than advancing her on the uh, schedule. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, what time is it? Well, 745. 7.45. But it doesn't matter. If we can get done earlier, that's fine. So Mr. Good. Chairman, if it's okay with you, yeah. I've got a question that might give her a few extra minutes. If that's all right. Uh, it's acceptable to me. Is board we're going to let Mr. or the sheriff come back up and of say course. a few words? Absolutely, of course. Is, mine's a quick thing, nothing to do with, well, kind of a little bit more money, but nothing with the line items. Is the board available, able to make decisions tonight? The reason I'm asking, I'll give you a caveat. We have a grant that's available. It's uh, up to $75,000, but it's a 25% match. And on the what it's going to be paid for is strictly new portable radios and new repeaters, which we've talked about that needs to be in these cars, which is going to have to be somewhere along the way for the vehicles, for the radio project. 
So I'm trying to get this paid due grant, but it's a 25% match. So they might not give me but $2,000, they may give me $75,000, but if it's $2,000, I can handle that on my own. But if it's $75,000, I will need to obviously some help from the board for the 25% match, which I believe is 17 ish, 18000 It's fine. Yeah, yeah, as long as Susan tells us, the you know, we can work the money and all that. And I'm hoping giving them these uh, quotes will help with more money, but a lot of times we just give, you know, 5000 something like that. But I'm hoping we can get a lot more money. Is that something we need to make a motion? Well, Sheriff, knowing, you know, the background or the background yeah, right. behind your request <laughs> and that, I would, uh, the board would entertain a motion to, make that proposal that we match for the 25% for the grant, if the board's open to make that motion. I'll make it, I'll make the motion that we match that grant. Is there a second? Second. Do we need to be any more specific than uh, that? Has it been awarded? Not yet. That, that, I don't know the amount yet. Okay. He's just At the time of award, saying. we would bring it back to yeah. the board. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hmm. I guess there's not. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Wilson, would you like to resend your motion since that's yeah. not required at this time? Yes. Oh. Yes. Do you agree with that, Mr. Sure. Hips? Yeah. All righty. Motion has been rescinded. Do you want to talk about his his agreement while he's here, or uh, the sheriff's agreement with the town? Oh, sheriff. Yeah. Oh. As long as you're here, let's advance the agenda and talk about your MOU with the town. That's the last piece of paper you have there in your package, gentlemen. This MOU is just to basically get us through the physical year. So January 1, January 1 when I started, obviously there's a, a supplement that's paid through the town for the sheriff's stipend. Um, and for me to get this stipend, we needed something in writing saying that the town was going to pay that. So I went before the town council in order to get the MOU stated. There are some things with any MOU that are going to be added is reason why it's not a – concrete MOU right now. It's kind of a temporary one just to satisfy the county to know that they are going to pay the sheriff's stipend up until we can get the finalized MOU out. Um, so I'm working with the town right now to get the other MOU going. This was just to satisfy the, um, the county to show that they were going to pay the stipend of the sheriff's pay. Ms. Adams, yes. Um. <coughs> I think we will have to ask for additional local funds because the town gives a supplement, um, the stipend, but they give it quarterly as mm -hmm. a stipend and not part of his salary. But I think he probably wants it as part of his salaries so you can get BRS benefits. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we, we the locality, the county would be responsible for that 26.47% or whatever of that stipend to pay those benefits. So that would be required local, more local funds. So this board would have to vote on that. So we need to do that before we vote on a memorandum or? Well, if you just a head nod and what we'll do is when we have to put that money in, we'll bring it back to the board for approval. But I wanted you to know ahead of time that that's what we're doing in my Sure, and that's going to be worked out then with the new MOU with all that out. There's, you know, they were gracious enough to give us a vehicle, and, and one of the things I'm asking, haven't been before me yet, but try to honor out is getting one every so many years, reoccurring type thing, uh, to help out as well, and some other financial things that Ms. Adams and I have spoke about to speak with the town about as well. So that's the reason it was, it was a spring of the moment thing that we did uh, when their first meeting came up, and it was just to satisfy basically to make sure that uh, for one, I got paid, and also the, the town um, pays for a couple extra deputies as well to make sure they got paid. So are they, are they getting magnetic decals to put over the town of Atmatic's <laughs> uh, symbol on the vehicle they're giving yeah, you? That's right, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just differentiate, that's all. <laughs> Any other questions about it? Any other questions for the sheriff on this MOU? If not, the chair will tender a... Uh, a motion on whether or not to approve this memorandum. MOU.
I make a motion to approve the MOU with the town and the sheriff. Is there a second? I'm still reading. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I will say it does mirror mm -hmm. the one that was with the previous sheriff. Mm -hmm. They've been doing that for a year, haven't they? It's been longer than that. But, I mean, they, they haven't – I don't know about the request. If it mirrors it, I'm assuming they have. But we've, you know, gone before them and gave them the stats anyway. Well, since you're making one up for the town, I'd like to see one for the county. By all means. I think it's good pertinent information that uh, each of us can be get better educated in. See why you need so many more deputies. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm administrative, yeah. yeah. For those of you who are wondering what the HB 599 allocation is in number six, that is um, monies that come from the state to the town for a police department. So it's like $50,000 a year that the town receives to operate a police department, which my understanding is they supplement more above that in this agreement. I might want to add to that. When the first HB 599 came out, mm -hmm. the town got right at 100,000. Wow. Yes. Wow. And we had your own police department. And we had our own police department. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of things changed. Yeah. What's the intention of number eight? Um, holding harmless the town from direct liability of payment, salary, wages, compensation. And then the second part, the town should not be liable for compensation and indemnity to any county employee for injury or sickness. What's the, what's the intention of that, boss? I would, think, I would think so. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I apologize. I, did, I didn't bring the MOU with me tonight. Well, since we have a town representative here, can we ask Mr. Simpson what the intention is of number eight? All right. Okay. Thank you, Shredder. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Okay. I'll second. All right. Motion is made by Mr. Wolfskill, seconded by Mr. Hips. Is there any further discussion? All right. Mr. Carter? Oh, aye. Mr. Hips? Aye. Mr. Wolfskill? Aye. I also aye. vote aye. The memorandum with the county is approved. Thank you. And once the, the new one is drafted, I'll obviously present that to you as well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful night. You too. Thank you too. I personally hate to Wait. start without the library board here if they're going to, I'd like to hear what they're going to say. Were they just going? They were just going to be your backup. You got to wait a half an hour there. I just assume we move on. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. All righty, Miss Bloodworth, you're on. <laughs> John, I just like that one sentence. Do forgive me. I've never had to present a budget before, so you will forgive my naivete and my inexperience, but here we are. So I'm going to use this as an educational opportunity to better serve Appomattox. I gave everybody a copy of this. 
Did you want a copy as well? I do have another one. Okay. All right. And like I said, you will forgive me for not my naivete, but I am Catherine Bloodworth. I have been employed with the County of Appomattox since 1996, full time since 1998. So you can do the math. That's pretty extensive. Um, I am here to talk about the library's need for an extra $55,000 to make us Virginia State compliant and to bring up the director's salary to $65,000. That does not mean me. I am only interim, and I do not hold a master's degree in library science. So this budget is not for me. This is to seek a qualified candidate for the directorship of the library. I'm only holding it together until such a time as one can be found. I do know that they are interviewing. Um, I would like to thank you for allowing me to come before the Appomattox County Board of Supervisors to discuss the J. Robert Jamerson Memorial Library's upcoming budget needs. I am aware that I am seeking $54,855 for the next fiscal budget. I'm here to expand upon my reasonings why it is important to have the full funding I am seeking. The Jamerson Memorial Library is a county-owned public library that proudly serves the population of Appomattox and beyond. It is, in, it is imperative that we maintain and surpass our ever-growing number of outreach programs, events, special education opportunities, civic duties, meeting the public's need for internet and Wi-Fi, as well as keeping the increased demand to carry the newest books, audio, magazines, and movie titles. The library is a valuable resource to every person that enters our facilities. The community relies upon the library through our priority of enhancing the educational, inspirational, and entertainment aspects for everyone that comes through our doors. I have been in communication with the Library of Virginia to make sure that I am seeking compliance with receiving full funding for state aid. I must express the importance of meeting these requirements set forth by the Library of Virginia so as to not risk the partial loss or full loss of state aid. Unfortunately, $11,553 of the fiscal year 23 is going to be redacted in 2024. It was not spent by the library. Um, Diana left. I only had two months when I took over in May, I had May and June, and the money was not in the line items. I couldn't spend what I didn't have, so they will be redacting it for the last quarter of 2024. If we do not meet and spend 2024's funding, we could possibly lose all of 2025 state aid. Um, there is a list of not only will we lose state aid, we, we lose the services provided by the Library of Virginia. And there is a full list on page one and two. These are the services that the Library of Virginia provides to all Virginia State libraries that qualify for state aid. They will on, they, we could possibly lose, and I will use that term, possibly lose, they will unsubscribe us from all these services. Ms. Budworth? Yes. Uh, Mr. Wofsko would like to ask a question. Sure. Mr. Wofsko? I didn't understand the possibility of being removed from the state library affecting the funds. Just do that again, please. Um, okay. In 2023, <clears throat> we lost our director. We went several months without a director, and then I was made interim director. We did not spend $11,000 of state aid. If we do not spend all of, a, all of state aid in 2024, we could possibly lose all of our funding for 25, which is at the moment, I believe, $78,000. Not only does the Library of Virginia provide the state aid money, they also provide other services, and that's what you'll find at the bottom of page one all the way through page two. It's the universal classes, the vet now, the transparent languages. 
these are all free online resources that the Library of Virginia gifts all the libraries in Virginia that qualify for state aid. If we do not qualify for state aid, they, they could, at their discretion, unsubscribe us from these services. So it's not just the money, it's universal classes. Universal classes is over 500 free courses if you go through our website with a valid library card. These courses run from 200 to $1,000 if you have to pay for them through universal classes, but they are free provided by the Library of Virginia. That's just one of the many services that the Library of Virginia pro provides this library free of charge because we do at this moment qualify for state aid. Did that clarify or am I? I understood sure? the ramifications. I didn't understand the, I didn't understand the implica, implica, implication of why the threat of losing is so valid. I'm a bit confused as to my why, question. Yeah, why do you not think veteran services? For no, 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 no. I understand the okay. valid the validity of the of the okay. programs that are at that are supposedly at risk. My question is, what makes you so sure that if we don't do whatever you're referring here that we have to do, that's going to cost us another fifty thousand dollars? that would jeopardize all that. I don't understand the connection. If we lose state aid in 25, I okay. I understand if, if we lose state aid. Yes. My question is, why are you so concerned that we might lose state aid? Because Part of the reason is because we did not spend $11,000 in 23, and my line items do not match up for the money we were given in 24. There needs to be more money in my budget in 24, but that is for another debate when I need to go before the board and ask that these line items be rectified to reflect 24 money. Right now, I'm, I'm seeking the 25 budget. Okay. And then in here, I put the letter from the board seeking. This is the worksheet that I did. And if you see the one that is behind the county worksheet, this is the breakdown of the 25 money. The blue on top is the library's director salary. The director salary at $65,000, $16,250 will be paid for by Virginia State with the 25% that is allowed from Virginia State to be put toward the director's salary. So when asking for $65,000, remember that sixteen five dollars will be paid for by the Library of Virginia once we get a certified director. Everything else in the darker yellow qualifies for state aid reimbursement. The ones in the light yellow do not. So you have to, um, office supplies, books, craft supplies, electronic materials, audio, visual, newspapers, traveling equipment, furniture, all that can be used. State aid money can be used to pay for all that. What state aid does not cover is things like the electric bill, the water bill, postage, and dues and membership. And then I have got a budget narrative where I went through each line item that is for the library and with an explanation as to why things did not go up or why things should go up. And you'll notice, like, in furniture, I've been there since 98. The building opened in 92. We have not replaced a table. We have not replaced the chairs, the desks. 
bookcases. We have replaced nothing. And there is a need to expand one large bookcase is $10,000. That's a lot of money. So do I want to replace bookcases? No, but my 30-plus-year-old oak chairs that have been splitting for years, um, I, it, it's time for them to be replaced. And some things I like part-time salary. I asked for a 10% increase to cover wages, to cover cost of living, to cover whatever percentage the Virginia state will go up. Yes. Yes. Forty seven. I do believe it was forty seven or forty eight. But as Brandon Barney had given all of you the information, because I was not privy to any of that, because it does not involve me. It involves it involves the hiring of a new director. Um, we should be paying about sixty five. That is not an unreasonable amount to ask somebody who needs to go to college to get a master's degree in library science. The Library of Virginia feels so strongly about that, that if you do not have a director with a master's degree in library science, you lose 25% of your state aid if you are not actively seeking a director. The Library of Virginia is aware that we are actively seeking a director, but it's been 11 months. And they meet again in April, and they will decide if they are going to either take 25% away or let us to continue to pursue a director without the loss of those funds. So I think putting the director salary at 65 shows them that we are still willing and we are actively seeking and in order to make a living wage in Appomattox, 65 is not unreasonable. Like I said, it doesn't affect me. I don't see that money. When you advertise, you advertise for... 48. How much? 48. 48. 48. We have one candidate who is qualified. Everybody else has not been qualified. As far as I know, that is something that you'd have to ask the library board. Like I said, that is a hiring committee in closed session that belongs to the library board. That is not for me to know at the moment. I do know that they did conduct one interview with somebody qualified, and that's all I know. And, you know, you got to sweeten the pot in order to get somebody with those qualifications to walk in the door. Personally, I like to advertise maybe for 55 plus. Well, Mr. Carter, I believe that's a library board decision, not Ms. Bloodworth's decision. But we have to, we have to provide a certain Right. So therefore, it comes. Aha. Uh -huh. Here comes the library board right now. Ah. It's here. Yeah. Brandon, your copy is online. Like I said, that is, that is. We're running ahead of schedule, Brandon. That is the average cost of a library director for a library our size in our population. So I don't think 65 is unreasonable. There. There was a question, Brandon, that I guess you have to answer. Mr. Chairman. What's going on? Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes. Um, I just, I'm not, this question is not directed towards you, but I think uh, Mr. Barney did a great job sending us the information about what was needed in order to be able to get a pool of qualified candidates. And I think that, you know, that was really spelled out very well for us. And, I, and to me, it's no question about 
um, the fact that we are way below. I mean, they even had every county around us kind of spelled out. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's crystal clear to me that in order to get a high-quality uh, candidate, that we have to increase on the salary. So the question is, I'm just making a comment. It's not a question to you. May, may I respond? Mr. Chair. Just because we're paying 65 doesn't mean that we're going to get somebody with a ink wet certificate. 65 will bring somebody with an established career. 65 is enough to bring somebody who out of state. 65 is enough to bring somebody who has experience. But if you're going to offer 48 to 50, you are going to get fresh off the press degree or somebody who wants to retire, not somebody who is in the prime of their degree. And so we haven't been getting that influx yes. of candidates. Um, I have been, like I said, I've been here since 96. And every person that we have hired has either A, just gotten their master's degree, getting their master's degree, or on the back end of retirement for their master's degree. You want somebody with five, 10 years of experience who wants to put 10 years in this county. And you're not going to get them unless you're willing to pay a decent living wage. And like I said, I don't think 65 is unreasonable. So the other zero on there was, say, from the former library director, we paid for, we paid for her education. Yes, sir. That, I, I was not aware of that. That was not made privy to me. Um, there is a waiver that you can get from the Library of Virginia to use state aid to pay the tuition, nothing else except tuition, which runs about $2,000 a quarter. But if you're offering 65, then you don't have to do that because they've already got their degree. That would be one of the requirements. If you want somebody at 65, they have got to have their master's degree in library science already established. Okay. That's going back to the 55 that I spoke of earlier. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sure be more than happy to take a job as a library director for 55000 in that nice county. Amen. I'm not talking about up north somewhere. Oh, 65 well, is not... I so I may interrupt. I think the, the board is getting into the library board's uh, wheelhouse here, and I think we should, you know, stick to the, the budget request and let the library board discuss the requirements of the director and how much that... Uh, they want to pay and then bring it. So unless the board has some direct questions for Mr. Barney, chairman of the library board, then I, I think, oh, I vice chair, I, I, I think uh, we can move on. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that's fine. I just like to be known to what's not thought so. Uh, appreciate I, that, Mr. Chairman. I Carter. appreciate Mr. Chairman, that. I did have a question I really for Mr. Do. Barnes, if I may. Mr. Wolfskill, do you have a question? I do. Mr. Barnes, Linda, or Ms. Bloodworth was talking about how many applicants came forth, how many you may have interviewed, but she said she couldn't really tell us the number because she's not on. Can you tell us how many people you have to, you have talked with? One. One, that's what she said. Yeah. Now, do they already have a master's degree? They do not yet. They she do not finished in two years. She's working on it. Any other questions for uh, Thank you. about the library? I didn't mean to cut you off, Mr. Carter. I, no, I'm sorry. I've already, already assumed that in the past, okay, that now is the time to ask questions. Too. Yep. I'm happy to answer any budget-related questions that you have. All right. Hearing no quite further question on the budget, well, thank you for your presentation and is well-prepared and well-documented here. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've never had to do this before, so I made sure that I got as much information as I could. Well, you did. Thank Good you. job. I appreciate that. Does anybody have any questions for me? I've left my contact information at the end of my presentation, just in case anybody wishes to reach out. 
Am I dismissed? <laughs> <laughs> I, feel yes. like, I feel like I'm going to school. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was 745 and I was just in the church. Yeah. Good way. Call and see if they can come. Oh. Okay. Thank you guys so much. You bet. <coughs> Since none of the other presentations, presenters here right now, I'd take a motion for a 15 minute recess. Oh, it's, it's a, okay. Who's out in the hallway? Oh, it's right here. So moved. All right, 15 <laughs> minutes. 15 minute recess. We've already done action item three. Why don't we go to action item two while we're waiting for and clear that off the board while we're waiting for our next presenter. Um, <clears throat> the result of the safety committee meeting is this. The safety committee, meeting, uh, committee unanimously uh, asks that the Board of Supervisors reject all three vendor, vendor bids submitted for the radio project. And also the, say, public, the safety committee unanimously recommends that the Board of Supervisors terminate remaining phases of the contract with CTA and have the county attorney determine if further monies are owed to CTA under the current phase of the contract. Both those recommendations were unanimous by the safety committee. So, what is the board's wishes? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Wilson, I don't Mr. know. Mr. Uh, I'm not that familiar with it. But uh, if that's what the committee said, then that's fine. Let's move. Mr. Wilson? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we adhere by the suggestion of the safety committee and rescind all the contracts and <clears throat> terminate the CTA's well, contract. Two motions there. Oh, you want two motions? Yeah, we need one motion to reject the three vendor bids and then another motion would be to terminate our remaining phases with C contract with CTA. I'll restate my motion. I make a motion that we reject all, rescind all the... It'd be reject. You reject all yep. the... All the, bids. all the vendor bids. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, a uh, motion made by Mr. Wolfskill to reject all three vendor bids on the uh, proposed P25 radio system. And it was seconded by Mr. Hips. Mr. Carter? Uh, Mr. Hips? All right. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Wolfskill? Aye. I vote aye also. Any motion on the recommendation to terminate the contract, remaining phase of the contract with CTA? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Wolfskill. I'd like to make a motion that we <clears throat> terminate the remaining contract with the CTA. A second. Second. Discussion. All right. Motion is made by Mr. Wolfskill to terminate the remaining phases of the contract with CTA. Second by Mr. Hips. Mr. Carter. Uh -huh. Mr. Hips. Aye. Mr. Jones. Aye. Mr. Wolfskill. Aye. I vote aye also. Ms. Adams, do you have anything <clears throat> to talk about while we're waiting for, or let's see. Mr. Jones just walked in. Oh, okay. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Let me 
see Uma. Well, no. Hey, Mr. Bruce Jones, Extension Office. Come on up. I would like to uh, first thank you for giving me the opportunity to come before you this evening to to uh, go over my budget request. And uh, I'll start out with the salary uh, request figures. Uh, at the direction of my district director, Sonia Ferguson, uh, the salary re request does include funding for a 4-H position. And... Uh, I would just like to, to let the board know that Appomattox County is still in, in a good uh, percentage um, figure regarding local funding. Uh, we are still at a one-third local funding. Uh, other localities for some of the agent positions are actually paying much more. So I've, I've, I've fought for that over the years and, and kept that level at that without having to have the administration ask for an increase. Are, are there any questions on that? Uh, and if, if, if the board desires, I can break that down even further by positions uh, if, if the board doesn't choose to do so. But my, my district director thought that <coughs> it, it's best to have some money allocated up front to allow the position to be filled other than my having to come before the board at some point in the future to ask for additional funding. Mr. John, I'd like to say this. Thank you for what you've done in keeping cost at a level, pretty much a level degree there. Okay, well, I've, I've, I appreciate you. Thank you. I, I've, I've, I try to do my best. And uh, I did include a request for a summer internship uh, position. And uh, we've had the, uh, several positions in the past. Uh, that is uh, a position that would be funded um, roughly 50% by Virginia Tech and 50% local. Uh, that position is designed for a uh, college junior, preferably. Uh, could be a college senior, and that would offer an experience where they would uh, participate across all of our extension um, uh, tasks, whether it be the family and consumer science, 4-H and youth, or agriculture and natural resources. It's kind of just uh, a program, hopefully, to, to uh, train future extension agents. Mm. So um, I, I did put that request in, and that request would be for the uh, $2,570 local. Uh, that, that system is set up for uh, roughly a 10-week type experience for, for an individual. And uh, I, I did put back in uh, some line items. Uh, the first one would be the professional dues and memberships. Uh, that request is $250. Uh, that would cover my membership in the uh, national as well as the state county agriculture agent associations. Uh, also, I put in some uh, funding requests for professional development or continued education for, for myself. Uh, we've, we've had that item in the past, and in a lot of the years I did not utilize it, but uh, I, I did put that in. Uh, I put in a new item this year, program support, and uh, I didn't know exactly how to word that, so I put that in at $500. Uh, we're, we're seeing, um, uh, it, it's well, expenses have gone up. And uh, a lot of the facilities that I, I, I was able to utilize for meetings at no charge are now charging, and, and that's expected. So that's why I put that request in there, just to help cover some of those facility costs so I can keep programs as cheap as possible for, for the uh, participants. And um, also, uh, we've always in the past requested $800 just to help us with our travel. Uh, in, in recent years, we've been blessed that the funding from Virginia Tech has been sufficient to cover the mileage that I use since I do use my personal vehicle. So I did put that in there just, just in, in case we do run into some issues uh, on, on that front. Uh, does anyone have any questions regarding any of my requests? Any questions from the board? Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. thank you again for, for letting me come before you this evening. You're welcome.
Thank you for everything you do. Yes. Farmers are our future. Without farmers, we're dead in the water. The extension services are so important. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> So, Mr. Seltz, are you making the presentation for the registrar, or are you waiting for the registrar to uh, arrive? She's here. She's here. Oh, she's <laughs> And I saw you walk in and sit down. I'm... So I'm kind of doing both. <laughs> He's doing both. Uh, this year, uh, we have a, a, a few things that are a little different that only come up every 10 or 12 years. Um, if you, I, I, uh, We submitted a uh, capital improvement a capital equipment plan uh, to cover the uh, obsolescence or a pending obsolescence of the voting tabulators, the express ballot markers, and the potential for uh, the need for electronic poll books. Um, the lifetime of these machines, uh, like any other computer, the machines are maintained every year. They're reliable, however, they're getting out of date. Uh, they're the uh, software vendors uh, get to where they, uh, they uh, can't support them anymore, and um, we, uh, we, we know that these things have a, a life cycle of about 10 to 12 years, the DS200 uh, tabulators that you put your, slip your ballot into uh, when you vote. Um, so we have, are trying to look ahead a couple of years and, uh, so that the county can plan for the... Uh, uh, for the replacement of those, along with uh, what are called the express vote machines, which are the ballot markers for uh, for uh, folks that can't physically mount, uh, uh, mark a ballot, um, we have uh, have to have those at, at every uh, at every precinct. Uh, plus, we can use those also as uh, as a uh, replacement. Um, uh, sorts of ballots rather than printing ballots if we were to run low, which we don't ever expect to do, but in an emergency if we did, we can use the ex uh, express vote ballots to uh, to uh, cover that. Uh, additionally, uh, there's 133 voting districts in the state. Uh, eight of them still use paper poll books. We're one of them. So we're one of eight out of... Uh, out of 133 still using paper poll books. Now, we are not, obviously, early adopters of technology, um, uh, and we have evaluated electronic poll books and decided that we at, can do just fine uh, without them. We've surveyed the, the precinct chiefs and um, everybody involved, and we have no problem uh, with accurate records and timely reporting with paper poll books. Um, however, uh, given that we're, you know, seven or eight percent are the only uh, districts left that still do those, it's liable to be become a state requirement before too long. Uh, we're, you know, the state likes things to be consistent. They have uh, requirements they set, which we're perfectly able to meet with paper poll books. But if they start requiring them by law, then we've got to be ready to do that. So. What we're proposing is that um, uh, instead of completely equipping ourselves with, uh, pay, uh, with electronic poll books, that we have a pilot program with two that we will use if for absentee uh, uh, voting in the, or early voting in the uh, CAP precinct and uh, be able to use those uh, and try them out, see how we like them, and uh, get ready for the potential uh, need for them. So... Uh, uh, those items are in the capital improvement plan, uh, capital equipment plan. Uh, and hopefully, we'll uh, be able to uh, plan ahead. There's no absolutely hard and fast date on that. Uh, we believe that they probably should be in place by the 2026 uh, election if we can do that. Um, if not, uh, you know, it probably would. Uh, it wouldn't be a showstopper, but we'll cert we would certainly be at risk of. Uh, having machines that, you know, can no longer be supported. So uh, are there any questions about about those? Those are some, you know, big ticket items for long-term planning that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we that we got in place. 
Yeah, it, I thought it was pretty, uh, lack of a better word, pretty nifty that uh, those express voting machines can be used to print ballots if we need them. Uh, the registrar was explaining that to me the other day when I stopped in, and I thought that was a benefit to us. It is, and uh, there's a lot of districts around the state that are starting to realize uh, hey, rather than going through the process of, of uh, printing on demand, which is a lot of overhead associated with and so forth, we've already got the ballots there. And uh, if uh, something happened, um, uh, and we're we're pretty we're pretty conservative about uh, ordering ballots. Of course, you don't you've got to account for any ones that you have. Uh, if you get them printed, you're keeping them forever or a long time. Anyway, you've got to go back to the clerk's office and all that. So. You don't want to print more than you have to because it's a lot. But on the other hand, uh, if you run out, it's a, you know, that, that's a disaster. You can't do that. So uh, we make sure that we order enough um, to, to get it through but not overage. And if something happened, if the, the dog ran in and ate the ballots and ran out, we could still uh, uh, handle that with uh, express vote uh, ballots. So. If I'm reading this sheet right, it looks like you're being pretty frugal. It says 2024, 64,479, and it says 2025, 64,978. If I'm reading this correctly. Oh, uh, for the, which? which yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, for the electoral board budget, that's correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, we're, we're doing things like years ago, just a couple of examples of a uh, prior um, uh, registrar bought a whole lot of stamps, uh, postage stamps, and stamped envelopes with them. And of course, those weren't forever stamps. Those were like 35 cent stamps and 40 cent, two cent stamps and stuff. So we've got those, and we actually have people that, you know, volunteer to come in and put so that we can use all those up, because we had thousands of them. <laughs> we can use all those up to buy, you know, 12 cent stamps and 15 cent stamps and whatever we got to have and put them on there. Uh, you know, anytime I get a printout from uh, on the budget or anything else, I have to look twice to see which side of the paper it's on because we don't let, if we've only used one side of a sheet, we turn them over in the printer and feed them back in, you know, if it's, if it's just stuff that we're using in the office. So when you, you know, we, we're trying to be pretty frugal with things like that because, uh, uh, well, we're, we're all taxpayers too. And, we know you've got to, you've got to account directly to them. Uh, on the budget, uh, the annual budget, um, essentially, it's essentially the same as it has been. Um, you know, we're doing things like uh, we're now using uh, county employees to move the voting machines. We did that last year. That worked. Uh, so rather than spend $4,800 this year moving them for three elections, which is the <coughs> county maintenance guys who are already on the payroll do that now. And so that's worked out. And uh, so that's an item that, you know, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to budget for anymore. Well, I know Mr. Carter is certainly glad that is because that's been a stickler with, Amen. with us. Well, we, he, he'd that. expressed that, and so we're, we're trying to uh, trying to make that happen. We did make it happen, so we, we appreciate the uh, uh, the uh, maintenance uh, department doing that and follow. We just we did a short set of specs that said here's what needs to happen. They did it, and uh, we've we've got no more trouble with with uh, having to budget for that. Um, in terms of the budgets, they are. Uh, Pretty much the same as we have had uh, so far. We haven't didn't have any big increases in any areas. Salaries, uh, of course, there have been uh, you know increases in the uh, the raises that uh, the county uh, employees got. Uh, plus, we uh, we we asked last year uh, for uh, an amount for our uh, new deputy. Uh, registrar. Uh, we were uh, allocated the minimum amount, and we, we were hoping that we could uh, do more. But on the other hand, it was the very first year. We didn't know who we were going to hire um, and so forth. Well, we have hired someone now who has proved themselves to be uh, a very viable
backup and replacement for the registrar. Uh, he can do anything that the registrar can. And um, uh, it has a great, a great number of computer skills. And um, uh, so we are hoping to be able to uh, uh, bring his salary to what we believe it needs to be for someone with, with uh, those capabilities. Uh, because it's, it's by no means just a uh, uh, entry level clerk position, but a true deputy registrar that can do anything the registrar can do. So, uh, other than that, I think that's uh, that's pretty much uh, what uh, all the highlights and new things about the the budget and the capital equipment plan. So, is there any questions? Mr. Rosco, any questions? No. Mr. Jones? No. Mr. Carter, any questions? No. Thank you. Well, I certainly appreciate this uh, capital improvement plan. Uh, outstanding so okay. register um i just wanted to say that lynn didn't mention the salary that we were asking for for the deputy and that's forty thousand, which was the same that we requested last year so while we appreciate the increase due to the um, salary survey it's actually the same increase that we got as the electoral board and ourselves already um and we believe that uh for the deputy with eight years of experience who has been a dr before He's really severely underpaid. So I appreciate your consideration of that. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, thanks for your consideration. All right, Miss Adams, you're ready to lead us through what's next? Your little worksheet here or that you feel strongly about you would like for me to go ahead and insert into the budget before we discuss it now would be a good time to kind of give me some direction I know you feel strongly about everything but I'm not sure if we'll <laughs> that's gonna work I can see you chomping at the bit mr. Rosco there's something you'd like to insert into the budget now? Okay. All right. Speak up. The totality of the sheriff's request. Your mic's off. Oh, I'm sorry. The totality of the sheriff's request is what I said. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Jones. Um, yes, I'd like to say, I'd like to find out how that would impact um, our whole budget process. Um, if it's going to come at the price of defunding our public schools, um, it's a red line for me. Um, so where are we going to get the money from? So, I mean, before we put something like that in the budget, I think we really need to have discussions. And that's a good point. When do you think you'll have the necessary information, Ms. Adams? Well, our next budget work session, I believe, is March the 5th, and that's a joint work session with the schools. So I don't have the schools request yet. <coughs> so in order to give you a complete, comprehensive overview of our budget, I would need to have those numbers to insert as well. And Mr. Chairman, let me say I'm totally for supporting law enforcement, but not at the expense of taking away from public education. Well, I agree with you 100%. And I really don't think, Mr. Jones, we could take it away from public education because we're kind of locked into that required local match. It's not something that we can monkey with. Well, I think we can monkey with it, but I'm hoping that we won't. You know, and I'm hoping that we can continue to fund schools at the require at least at the required local effort. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. But I, I was just going down, you know, some of these budget requests from outside agencies and just a rough calculation going down through there. If we were to seriously look at, 
you know, what's our return on investment, I think not matching some of these outside agency requests would fund at least one deputy. Are you looking at it? I'm looking at this sheet right here. Okay. Request yeah. for outside agency budget. This sheet here. As I go down through there and look at their difference or their increase request, if we took a sharp pencil of that, we could uh, pay for one deputy. Well, I will say I met with the Commission of Revenue, and um, I guess the real estate numbers didn't come through as well as I'd hoped they would mm. with the increased values of property. And with all the new building we got going up in the county? Whew. All for the course. Huh? Well, I mean, it may be like a, a half a million dollars increase, but I was thinking it would be a whole lot more. And then the only other question that's been on my mind is, uh, you know, looking down at Southside Quest, the American Civil War Museum is fifteen thousand. You got to know it here, per board agreement, fund fifteen thousand for five years. Did we really agree to that? That yeah, you took a vote to take that action. Uh, we still we'd have to yeah, we'd have to discuss that. That's right. I. I I specifically said I'd support it for one year in the motion. Um, Bill, Bill isn't here. That would be another. Um, we're not. We can't. <coughs> we can't bind a future board no. to a thing like that, anyhow. Mm -mm. Um, so that's not. Might be on there, but it doesn't mean we got to do it. Mr. Chairman, is that Mr. Tonight, Mr. Jameson, and Mr. Abbott, and all them are here? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we affirm that. <clears throat> then. then. For five years. Mm -hmm. And I abstained on that vote because I was a member of the advisory yeah. committee then, but I'm no longer a member of that advisory committee. So. I remember you when you did. I was absent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're absent. <laughs> yeah, it only it only carried with three, and one, one and, and one of the three was me, and I said I would do it for a year. So I didn't vote against the motion to re you know to put another motion forward. I made that clear. So that's that's where I was on that. I voted for all five years. And then I see this is quite an increase that Horizon <coughs> Behavioral Health is asking for too. Yeah. I mean, it's we, almost $22,000 increase. That's one of those unfunded state mandates. Oh, unfunded mandates. We're obligated to that. Um, Wanda has been in an exchange of emails to get clarification on what Appomattox's obligation is because the localities have to match their entire budget, their entire um, budget by a certain percentage and actually the percentage they have for Appomattox is only what four percent and they're saying that's under the number of clients that they actually serve of course we all know mental health is growing um, but they are the the, the CSB um, for our region And then also the, you know, Virginia Legal Aid Society. We didn't fund them in years past, and I said they're coming up and asking for sixty-seven hundred. Yeah. And they didn't show up tonight. What happened to uh, Shelter Workshop? Dan the Fog. Isn't that the name of? <laughs> that makes yeah. boxes. Uh, yeah. Oh, steps. Step. Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the um, yeah, the shred. What does that stand for? Shelter. <coughs> it may be. I'm it sorry, is. I'm not laughing at you. I'm 
I couldn't figure out what you were but speaking you hadn't of. Heard any. Well, we haven't received a request in years past. We chose not to give them a donation because yeah. we use their services for shredding. So we pay them monthly fees. So I think we pay about what six thousand dollars a month with all of our offices and the rental boxes, and maybe maybe a year. I don't know. Might be a year. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add, as far as legal aid is concerned, that is a safety net for the least among us. So I think we have to consider that as well. Um, did they, last year, did they report on how many people that they have requested services from Appomattox? Did they submit that in their request, Juan? That's a very small We had yeah. them scheduled Ask. to come this evening, but for some reason, I mean, we may find out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They weren't here. Yeah. Thank you. But we did receive a request, and she's got the packet. Oh, what about Mr. Chairman? What about uh, CDPC? CDCC. Central Virginia Planning District Commission. No increase in dues, no... Well, theirs is based on per capita. Okay. Um, yeah, that's in your packet, I, Mr. Moser. I haven't received a request from them, but Johnny Roark did put it in 8104, so let me see. What's 8104? That's the planning budget. I'm sorry. And Legal Aid did say a 35% increase in services to Appomattox clients I see this it. year. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Big increase. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. We know why. The sheriff spoke about it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, 314 dollars was the increase for the local government council, which is CDPT. And that's 3% increase per capita is what they were proposing. <clears throat> I'd like to see us, Mr. Chairman, do something with Piedmont Veterans Council. Um, even if it was 1,000 or 2,000 above to help them with that building. I know they're helping a lot of people. Um, that they are. I mean, I wouldn't mind doing the whole request, but my primary concern is crunching the numbers with what the sheriff asked. So that's what I want to hear first, after, you know, once we know what's going on. And then other other things um, we can consider. It sounds to me like maybe we want to wait and see what we have as far as revenue coming in and what the school budget says before we make and have a chance to take this home and read it and digest it before we uh, mm -hmm. take any further action. Amen. Mm -hmm. That being the case, I, Mr. Carter, do you have a recommendation? Yes, sir, I do, Mr. Chairman. All right. <laughs> Well, let's wait till nine. Oh, but are you crazy? <laughs> are you crazy? He says. 